Academic throwing a robe. No, let's just. Ah. <laughs> uh, once we get set up, we're kind Stand of. Stand up. Stand up. Somebody has to be showing the. There you go. I guess we're taking a picture. Yeah. So you have props? That's for the history books. <laughs> what? There's one for my interest. And yes. then our props. We always go for props. <laughs> We're already way behind now. <laughs> Got it? You all set? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Rally, everyone. Everyone's ready. Okay, so what did you want now? You no. want? You want to take a picture? <laughs> okay. How do I do this? We're going to have to change sides. Right. You know so you want just that? We will. For this. Oh. Wait, yeah. I can do this. Um, what do you, are you going to show? Yeah, there's just slides about the order of things. Yeah. Like, it's not, nothing much. All set? OK. Hey, Rao, Rao, she wants to take a picture. Yeah, I just oh, have a lot of people waiting, so this is where we sit at this table. Where's your motorboard, Rao? Your, ha your hat? It's gonna oh, he's going to wear it. There okay. is my motorboard. What are you talking about? OK, here, let's, let's stand up and let her take a picture so we can move on. OK. After I graduate, I put this other okay, side. Guys. I think I can do this now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right, so, uh, so do we have the technology? This is wait, wait, yeah, no, 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 I know. It's just me a second. I think I think so. This thing might actually work. I just know nothing about how to do these things. But are you going to connect it to? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great begins. <laughs> what? Well, I don't have the well, yeah. How can we go first? I've asked Jennifer. I don't have the connection. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I can go last. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't even know who's going first. Are you getting to leave it? What's Kevin on the side? No, I, I think we go second. Okay. So can we, does this show up at the, like, I just plug this thing in. Is it working? Oh, this one. We're all busy. Good. Um, so can you see? Can you just turn it up? Oh, okay, good. We just need to give it a second of the turn around. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, 
Covid também. Let's try receding it. Can we give hands? Uh, give a second, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're getting started now for the debate. Thank you for your patience. Uh, this is a, uh, a, an attempt to have a lighthearted discussion with some of the, the great thinkers of the AI community about a topic that, that we all really should care about. But because it's late in the day, and because we've had so many you know, deep, insightful talks to listen to for so long, we're going to try to do this in a lighthearted, entertaining way. Uh, the way that we've done that is that we have brought together a panel of, of truly amazing panelists who are uh, really overqualified, honestly, for what we're going to ask them to do. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you about their overqualifications in a moment. But, uh, but broadly speaking, we're going to ask them to take really extreme positions that they, they probably don't actually hold and to, to really argue with each other as forcefully as they can. We're going to try to avoid that problem of panels where everybody just agrees by just telling them what they have to think and making them say those things so that for our amusement. And, and then what, once that's all settled, we're, we're going to grudgingly allow them to say something about what they really think. Uh, and then we'll hear from all of you. So. The debate today is going to be about the proposition academic AI researchers should focus their attention on research problems that are not of immediate interest to industry. And uh, I'm going to quickly tell you about our illustrious panel, and then, uh, and then we'll move on to the debate. So on my left here, Carla Gomez is a professor of computer science and the director of the Institute for Computational Sustainability at Cornell University. She focuses on large-scale reasoning, optimization, and learning. Recently, she's become deeply immersed in scientific discovery for sustainability, and more generally, on the new field of computational sustainability. She's co-authored over 150 publications, which have appeared in venues spanning nature, science, a variety of conferences and journals in AI and computer science, including five Best Paper Awards. Her research group has been supported by over $50 million in basic research funds. We're going to be interested to hear whether some of those funds came from industry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to editorialize as I go, <laughs> as you can see. Um, she's a fellow of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, where we all are today, a fellow of the ACM, and a fellow of the American Academy for the Advancement of Science. So the second debater to my left, also arguing the four position, would be um, Rao, oh, I, I, say your last name, Rao, I can't do, I can't do it justice. <laughs> I, I'm going to get it wrong, and this it's going to be so embarrassing. This is one of the longer-term research problems that you need to start I know, natural about. language synthesis. Party. Say, say your first name. <laughs> <laughs> My industrial opponents are yeah. somewhat <laughs> slow witted <laughs> Subarao Kambhampati. Thank you. Yeah, what he said, is <laughs> uh, a professor of computer science at Arizona State University and has been working in AI research since 1983, although you wouldn't know it from his youthful complexion. <laughs> He's a fellow of the AAAI, the American Academy of Sciences, and the ACM. He served as the president of AAAI, and he would now like to let us know that he's now the AAAI past president, which I, I suppose makes sense. 
His current research interests are human-aware AI systems and the synthesis of explainable behavior for human-AI interaction. While he firmly believes in the purity of long-term foundational AI research, he wrote this text, he is also not wholly against big bucks from industry sugar daddies. <laughs> and he wants them to know that like Humpty Dumpty, he was pushed into this pro position. <laughs> All right. So uh, next uh, to my right, uh, Thomas Sandholm is the Angel Jordan Professor of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University. He's co-director of Carnegie Mellon's AI uh, department, I gather, and uh, the founder and director, no, something like that, though. Um, and he's the founder and director of the Electronic Marketplaces Laboratory. Uh, in parallel with his academic career, he's done a ridiculous number of things in industry. We had to go back and forth several times to shorten his CV to a point that, <laughs> that all of you can manage. Um, he, uh, he began by founding, chairing, and CTO slash chief scientisting combined net between 1997 and its acquisition uh, 13 years later. He's founder, president, and CEO of Optimized Markets, which brings optimization-powered paradigm to advertising campaign sales, scheduling, and pricing. His algorithms run the largest kidney exchange in the US, and his team is a multi-time winner of the annual computer poker competition. In his spare time, he's founder, president, and CEO of Strategic Machine, which provides solutions for strategic reasoning in business, finance, and gaming applications, uh, whatever that means. And he's founder, president, and CEO of Strategy Robot, which is providing strategic reasoning solutions for defense and intelligence. Hmm. I'm tempted to say last but not least, but that's then going to make you wonder who's least. So I'll just say last <laughs> is Eric Horvitz, who's a technical fellow at Microsoft and uh, where he also serves as the director of Microsoft Research, uh, which some of you might have heard of. Uh, he helped to nurture Microsoft Research as the organization evolved from a handful of people to over 1,000 people across eight labs around the world. He's a recipient of the Alan Newell Award and the Feigenbaum Prize for Advances in AI. He received the Sig Chi Academy Honor for Advances in Human-AI Interaction. He's been elected fellow of the AAAI, ACM, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy of Engineering. He was president of AAAI in 2008 to 2009, and he's the founding chair of the Partnership on AI and has served on the advisory boards of the National Science Foundation, DARPA, the National Institutes of Health, and the Allen Institute for AI. Phew. Look at this amazing panel we have. Let's, uh, let's get down to it. So we're now um, going to begin by asking all of you to vote. Uh, hopefully some of you are doing this already on Twitter. Uh, if you haven't, uh, feel free so that we can get an accurate count. Uh, but we'll also do kind of a show of hands in the room. Now, the, the way that an Oxford-style debate works is that um, we, we recognize that it might not be a 50-50 split at the beginning. So what we're, we're trying to work on the diff here. So we want, to, we want these guys to change your minds. So we're going to, first of all, poll you to find out how you feel. We're then going to have a debate, and then we're going to poll you again and see uh, if any minds were changed. And uh, we will begin by, um, by doing a, a show of hands here, and uh, you can also vote on Twitter. So, um, those in favor of the proposition that academic AI researchers should focus their attention on research problems that are not of immediate interest to industry, raise your hands. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> and those of you who are against the proposition, raise your hands. Okay, shall we be done now? I'm going to say that's about 60-40 <laughs> maybe. It's uh, certainly more people uh, on the pro you need glasses. position. Hang on you a second. Um, um, hang on a second. How many people here are based in industry? How many, I'm academia, really sorry. how many academia? <laughs> just checking, just checking on the bias here. <laughs> yeah, it's about the same proportions, oddly enough, right? <laughs> Although I'm not sure if it's the same people. All right, so uh, let's let the debate begin. We'll, we'll turn over to uh, I guess this side. I'm not sure which of you wants to yeah. go first. Oh, no question. Actually, the time is ticking, so I prepared a few notes. So, but I really, but we'll I'm... Closer to the mic, closer to the mic, put it in the mic. Okay, can you hear me now? So I truly believe that academic researchers should pursue bold ideas and tackle big challenges. The types of ideas and challenges that are too risky or too far out for industry to pursue, or they just don't have the economic incentive to pursue them. 
In fact, I think the key advantage of being in academia, the reason why they paid us the big bucks, <laughs> not really, is exactly the opportunity for us to follow our instincts and push the ideas we truly believe in and are passionate about. Even if everybody else is going for more fashionable topics. Academia gives us the, poss gives us the possibility of totally unconstrained thinking for a long term. This is awesome. And as we know, you know, a novel idea typically takes 10, 15 years or even 20, 20 years to get to the point of being picked up by uh, industry. So at the corporation, on the contrary, one needs to actually be aligned with the bottom line and cannot really pursue his or her big ideas in a totally unconstrained way. So of course, AI is the best example of how far we can go when we dare to think big. We would not be here if it were for a bunch of academic visionaries that dreamt of creating artificial intelligence in 1956. So in fact, for the first 50 years, uh, AI was largely dismissed and considered an academic fantasy. <coughs> Major, uh, but things have changed. Major innovations pioneered by academic researchers are now pursued by industry and they are profitable, very profitable, or have the potential of being very profitable. Of course, we, can, we always talk about the big success of backpropagation and deep nets. This is actually a great example of uh, how the perseverance and uh, long-term commitment of the three musketeers or the three godfathers of deep nets, even when others uh, didn't believe uh, in this, how really this paid off. But there are other examples for, that started, uh, really were pushed by academics. For example, spreadsheets, Excel, well, they actually started in academia, or web browsers, or vector space models for information retrieval, Google. So many, many examples that really started in academia. The second big point that I want to make is that AI researchers can and should play a key role in tackling great challenge facing humanity. And in fact, you know, my own research for the last 10, 15 years, I, I have devoted my research to nurturing the field of uh, computational sustainability that aims to uh, develop uh, computer science and, uh, uh, and AI methodologies to address key societal and sustainability challenges. We have a variety of projects running, uh, running from poverty mapping and poverty mitigation, uh, wildlife and biodiversity conservation, strategic uh, placement of hydropower dams in the Amazon uh, basin, and also accelerating the discovery of renewable energy for uh, 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 energy materials. Well, what's amazing is, you know, these problems are truly challenged and the unique complexity and scale of these problems actually require fundamentally new approaches for us to tackle them and by advancing and hopefully having impact in terms of sustainability, we are also advanced uh, AI. Uh, as a, a, a brief example, I've been working for about 10 years in uh, scientific discovery for fuel cells and solar fuels, and these problems are really challenging and defy completely, you know, the, the paradigms we are used to, like in machine learning. We don't have a lot of data. In fact, typically we have about samples of 500 points and we of course don't have label data. We need to produce solutions that are physically meaningful, that are interpretable. We, we do have a lot of scientific prior knowledge and you, you know, based in this context, we, we uh, uh, tried you know, reasoning. I come from reasoning, so that's what I tried first. It doesn't work. So then I try, we tried just machine learning. It doesn't work. So we really needed to come up with fundamentally new ideas combining reasoning and machine learning to, to address this point. So the, the, the key point that I want to make is this is a two-way street. By working on these challenges, we, act, we can actually also have impact in terms of uh, uh, big challenge 
sustainability, but also in terms of uh, our own field. And to wrap up, I would say the conclusion is industry should actually advocate for research funding for academia to tackle big challenge because it's good for everybody. Thanks, Carla. Um, so our second uh, pro debater will be uh, reluctantly uh, Rao. Hello. So the academic regalia signifies both my assigned role in this debate and the expected dark future I'm looking at after my side wins landslide in this debate and industries misunderstand my position about me getting their money. Uh, so the proposition before us is at once a general conundrum for all research fields, and but also something that's attained very special significance for AI. Research problems that are of immediate interest to the industry tend to be the low-hanging fruit. There was a time when AI didn't have any low-hanging fruit, but we are way full of them now. The fruit are almost touching the ground, seducing <laughs> all of us, even with very little intellectual capabilities, into immediate gratification. <laughs> A shorter way of putting it is there's easy money to be made. Most normal industries want to focus on using AI to draw random, indefensible conclusions from data. That's what has become AI research and industry in many, many places right now. Oh. <laughs> Kaggle. Kaggle is but a cheap entry gateway point to exploit this desire and to be part of some short-term research. Wow. And why would you work on short-term research problems with long-term salaries of academia, which means are really small? You want to work with his kind of salaries if you want to work on short-term problems. <laughs> And not surprisingly, faculty are off into industry, and in some university towns, the last faculty leaving academia are asked to please switch off the lights. <laughs> Situation has become such a head that I believe he spent about six months trying to find an academic willing to argue this position. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's one thing if AI is pretty much solved all its scientific problems, However, unlike purely industrial disciplines such as you know, databases, software engineering, AI is full of deep open problems of foundational nature. <laughs> All we did most recently is to do a bit of a breakthrough on tacit knowledge perceptual tasks. There's a lot more to do, and after all, that's what we've been talking about the last two days. It would be wishful to think that industry will find long-term research to be in their immediate interest. That's what my opponents will try to let you believe. Academia does, unfortunately, unfortunately, has a significantly higher tolerance for delayed reward than industry ever will. We no longer have Bell Labs with monopoly money pushing very long-term research. They just don't exist anymore. Unless you think there are deep minds at work in industry, <laughs> let me remind you that they are very much dependent on the whims, fancies, and share prices of the mothership. The pages, the pages of the history, industrial history, are not, are not too rife with tolerance for truly basic research on long-term horizons. My opponents will ask, what's so wrong with focusing on research of immediate interest to industry anyways? If my opponents had their way, Rudolf Pearl and Jeff Hinton would have been focusing on fast rule matching for expert systems during the 80s <laughs> industry AI hype. <laughs> Eric himself would have been focusing on all-time hacking rather than any-time computation. My opponents, such as, of course, Sugar Daddy, Eric Harvich, will try to convince you <laughs> that immediate interest research is the most important one. But just remember where he's coming from. This is Microsoft research he's coming from. It's been seen to be the most IV towers of the IV towers, except with much better salaries. So he's really interested in long-term research with better salary, which is fine. I'm also interested in that. <laughs> 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 to some extent, <laughs> <laughs> to some extent, godfathers of AI made my life easy with their arguments yesterday. Don Hinton asked you not to spoil it for everybody by solving easy-to-solve Sudoku problems and moving on. <laughs> Don Benjo frowned at the what can I complete in four months before the deadline kind of research. Don Lekun, Don Lekun is in Facebook and it's politically so incorrect to say anything nice about Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> So, in summary, 
The only way to make AI great again is for academia to focus on long-term research. <laughs> <laughs> The foundational problems we are talking about. <laughs> so the only way to make AI great again is for academia to focus on long-term research. The foundational problems we are talking about may well not be within reach very soon, but we can't win the battle if we don't even suit up. Eternally jockeying for short-term leaderboard positions and made-up benchmarks ain't going to help your field's short-term goals. Let's make AI great again. Vote pro. <laughs> All right, so, so now we've heard from the pro side with a mix of reasoned argument and wild hyperbole. <laughs> Let, let's see what the uh, against side has to offer in rebuttal. Thanks, Kevin. So first of all, I want everyone to think about the actual statement here. Should academic AI researchers focus their attention on research problems that are not of immediate interest to industry? That's what we're talking about. I say no. First, in the fast-paced world of AI, problems of immediate interest to industry are much richer and deeper than might meet the eye. They extend way beyond today's products and offerings. In fact, the problems being studied in industry, even in the immediate sense, are broad and deep, and they expand multiple areas of interest, even, I would say, and mainly academic researchers across the world. Large computing companies also need to stay fresh. They need to plan ahead to provide their customers with the best technologies that are available. They need to think beyond and outside of current business strategy and commitments. So a critically important role of an effective industrial R&D center is to build a culture of thinking out of the box thinking over the horizon, and thinking about potential technical disruptions ahead, and coming up with ideas that may lead to whole new directions for a company on a comp competitive terrain. Now, as one example, at Microsoft Research, we ask all of our folks to explicitly avoid a focus on the short term. In fact, we say to them that short-term needs and addressing them is kryptonite to our superpowers at the company. And these are the powers that are best focused on leading the company into the, into the future world. So the explorations and rich interests in R&D labs like MSR cannot be easily separated from problems explored or that should be explored in, at universities. Now on another front, rather than serving or believing that industry serves as a straitjacket that somehow constrains thinking, the motivations and focus of industry are actually field expanding and to find rich and broad areas of scholarly research. Industry research scientists have access to real world problems. Real world problems. <laughs> as well as large amounts of data. We have data. <laughs> we have rich signals from the outside world People actually use our stuff. <laughs> and we actually can track the performance of our systems in the open world. And there are also numerous examples of topics, whole areas of scholarship now that really you could say came out of industry. Robustness and safety, considerations of errors, drift, blind spots, challenges with going from simulation to the real world deployments, transfer learning among sites, we built an exp a, 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 deep, a, a deep model, even a, even a logistic regression for healthcare. If you did it in one place, you couldn't even take it to another hospital in the same medical system. Transfer learning is critical to make these things work, and you couldn't see them without trying your best to actually have real patients dealing with the inferences coming out of these models. Human AI interaction, bias and fairness, personalization. It's our systems that show up in the New York Times when there's a, bear, a, a, a fairness or a bias problem, not. University of Arizona system sitting in, in some sort of a small <laughs> closet. <laughs> I agree with you about University yeah, of Arizona. On. I'm from Arizona State University, so I'm completely <laughs> fine with you saying that about University of Arizona. So challenges and insights, challenges and insights that come from being in close touch with the real world and with the challenges of developing and scaling AI principles and methods into the open world are deep and interesting. This gives industry R&D early warnings 
for the whole world on deeply interesting questions uh, that sit at the frontier of scientific understandings and that define whole new directions. So the problems that we work on in industry and have to work on cover broad swaths of work of interest to AI scientists, whether they call home industry or academia. And these problems cover both theory and practice, applications and principles. So in sum, the spectrum of topics of immediate interest industry is large, covers important spaces, the problems cover a rich span of technical and empirical challenges, and in some ways, these, we, we, we pursue basic scientific knowledge that may, in a way that may be broader and deeper than the work in even the, the largest and most diverse computer science departments across the world at our labs. The work in industry R&D is informed by the real world rather than arising in the isolation of an ivory tower. <laughs> and I should say, where work may be guided by the constraints of government contracts, including the US and China military, and within the rigid constraints of promises made to government agencies. So I don't see clear and obvious need to separate artificially industry and academic R&D efforts, but instead great value in sharing and collaborating and teaming on these challenges wherever we sit, whether the problems are of immediate or longer term interest. And I'll just end by making a comment here as evidence of the value of shared thinking across industry and academia. In my experience, we've had numerous grad students come to our labs for internships and they find their summers to be rich, expanding scholarly experiences and a surprising high percentage of these students go back to academia, to their advisors and they say, can I please make the MSR project my dissertation topic? And often the answer is, it's so cool and deep, wow, let's do it. <laughs> so I'm gonna basically stop there, but my, 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 my sense is that if um, the problems happen to be, that the problems are shared, and my assertion that they, they clearly are across academia and industry, uh, that great work can be done as a larger community rather than setting up artificial fences and boundaries. Thanks, Eric. And now we'll hear from our last uh, debater, Thomas. Please uh, keep it on time if you can. Okay. So, uh, so uh, I think Eric and I are wasting time here. This is so obvious that there's no need for us to say anything. But I noticed in the beginning, a few of you had your hands up for the feeble-minded opponents on the other end of the table. So I'll, I'll say a couple of points anyway. I'll try to say four things in five minutes. So one, most fundamental research questions come from applications not from the transitive closure of proceedings. <laughs> so uh, as an example, when we started working on bidding languages in academia for combinatorial auctions, and I was doing it, Nomni San, Kevin, I see Moshe Tenenholtz back there, and so on, we went for generality. And when we took those types of bidding languages to industry, we got laughed out of the room. So in academia, we were com on a completely wrong path, and then when the industrial feedback gave us a direction, we moved to a totally different type of bidding language and then that spilled over to academia. So if we hadn't had that feedback, we would probably be still doing that thing we were doing in 99. <laughs> Secondly, uh, multi-agent preference elicitation, something that uh, now became a field that started uh, with Wolfram Conan and myself. It wasn't that we were somehow smarter than the next guy. Rather, in the applications, we saw that the preference elicitation bottleneck in combinatorial auctions became the bottleneck before the winner determination bottleneck, which we all thought in academia was the main problem. Again, we wouldn't have, at least not so quickly, preference elicitation for multiple agents if the real world hadn't fed that feedback. Uh, third example, automated mechanism design, which I started with Vince Konitzer, again, came from industrial applications is sourcing. Why would you ignore all of your knowledge in the supply base when you start to design your mechanisms? And that would have also taken a while if we didn't have that industrial feedback. Okay, second point. Uh, it is everyone's responsibility to make the world a better place. Professors should found companies to do that, or in some cases it's doable directly from an academic lab, but rarely. Big tech companies built their most novel things, I'm sorry, Eric, uh, built their most novel things when they were startups, not when they are big. The next debate. <laughs> this is another debate, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I guess I'm against everybody here. Uh, 
Uh, so um, academic research becomes the industry. This will not happen if academia works only on problems that are not relevant to industry. Three, there's a scary selection happening where practically relevant AI researchers go work for companies rather than staying at universities. This causes university AI re uh, research to become res relevant, but then who will educate relevant AI researchers for future generations? So therefore, university AI research needs to be relevant to the world and thus to industry. And four, and this is kind of a meta point, as AI becomes increasingly important in all parts of industry, if academia would focus on industry irrelevant AI research, there would eventually be no AI research left in academia. Thank you. All right, now it's time for the bare knuckle round where uh, <laughs> all of our candidates here are just gonna uh, basically uh, engage freely with each other. Uh, I, I've sort of asked them to, to think about this as though they're all talking heads on Fox News. Uh, s some of them uh, took this more seriously yeah. than others. <laughs> So, so I'm going to seed this conversation. Uh, I'll just uh, throw out a question to get them talking, but I'll, I'll invite them just to, uh, to light into each other and, uh, and say whatever they feel like. Uh, so um, le let me ask the, uh, th those on the industry side um, how academic researchers ought to re uh, respond uh, when gigantic amounts of compute are needed for uh, modern breakthroughs in AI and industry has an overwhelming advantage in access to this kind of compute. So my sense is that there's a responsibility in industry to think through the big ecosystem challenge uh, with, with the importance of academia, in particular for education, training, uh, and uh, um, think through resource constraints. How do we share data from industry to, to academia? What kind of collaborative agreements would work? How do we basically make uh, uh, grants and provide platforms for the compute? I think it's important that industry, industry think this through. I, I would say that uh, that's a very narrow question, Sp focus on big tech companies. When it comes to startup companies, most of them are very constrained in terms of compute. What do you guys think about this question? Come on. I thought you were just talking to them. I, I, thought, <laughs> I, I can't believe you let them finish the, the whole statement. This is the bare knuckle round, round. No, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the industry wants to do. That's, that's <laughs> their problem. I do have some responses to things that um, uh, Eric raised, if I might. Go uh, for respond. it. Okay. So, okay. So, apparently, New York Times has not written much about Einstein during his patent clerk days. And so, New York Times press is not exactly the way to decide whether or not the research is actually an interesting thing. In fact, this is a problem that we are facing. We would work on something that will just somehow come into the tech press. And right now, everything is pressworthy. I get almost as many press mentions as anybody else in the industry. That's not what What's we your should point, be focusing Rao? on. What is your point? I don't no, <laughs> I'm, you, like I'm sorry. I, your point was that you were saying that academia's work is not the one that is covered by the press. Right. You're but getting confused with Trump. That's why you're getting all this. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing, of course, is uh, this is a more serious point. We are not at all, none of us are saying industrial research has no meaning. Industry and academia existed with interesting cross-pollination across the times. The point is academia, for good reasons, have long-term horizons, um, and the industry will focus on things that need to actually come productified and will help us. I'm not at all questioning. I would, well, maybe not PowerPoint, but I would be very much uh, lost without Microsoft products. Mm -hmm. Maybe not PowerPoint, but- You the, lost anyway. You are lost the point anyway. Being, that products are important, but the research that led to the products oftentimes gets done in longer term um, you know, horizons. And again, I would like to point out that Microsoft research is typically considered by people who want to either go to academia for long-term research or just do long-term research in Microsoft. I'm not sure that Satya Nadella, <laughs> my compatriot, would believe that all of the work being done in Microsoft research is of immediate interest to the industry. There's a lot of great things that you guys did that actually helped you know, much later. And that's, that part we, of course, have to have um, across the board. Um, 
if I may. And then I think the current remuneration structure also is correct. I have this thing on my, uh, my uh, door, if you ever come to my office, that you know, uh, everybody, any person can get a uh, paid money, big bucks, doing what other people want done in a short term. The high art of living maybe actually to do what you want to do, and sometimes they take much longer time, or <laughs> much longer time. And, and, and so if I'm doing short term, immediate interest research problems, I would like to get paid the big industry salaries. And to some extent, that's exactly what you're seeing in the current outflow from academia, um, and we need to think about this. So, so Carla, I've got a question for you. So um, uh, paraphrasing slightly, it seems to me that uh, Thomas argued that uh, focusing away from industry's immediate interests means that academic researchers are necessarily less relevant. Uh, oh. Do you have any thoughts about that? And can you express those thoughts closer to the microphone? Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, actually, I noticed that uh, uh, Thomas emphasized that the industry has the real problems. And so we should focus on industry problems because they are the real problems. And I say, well, I fully disagree because, you know, there are much bigger problems that require much bigger solutions that really industry is not uh, uh, focusing on because they don't have the, inc the economic incentives. And in fact, by acad if we lead the way and focus on those problems, that's how we can actually uh, you know, make um, amazing progress. And I'm not talking about abstract problems. I'm talking about real world problems. And I happen to agree with Th Thomas on w one point that indeed, I, I, I don't think we should really fantasize, and often it's actually I important, and for example, in sustainability, to address the real problems, as opposed to, uh, uh, in fact, I learned a term how uh, 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 often computer science are good at CSing problems as opposed to solving the real problem. So I believe we should solve the real problems, and there are very deep questions that indeed are not tackled by industry and they will require fundamentally new solutions in the computer science and AI that will uh, 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 transform radically uh, uh, AI. You, you guys are all signaling to me like we're going to oh, be polite okay. here. So then I guess, yeah. <laughs> you guys haven't seen Fox News. Apparently. Impoliteness <laughs> is very easy for us. Um, so I, I kind of agree that fundamental research problems to Thomas, fundamental research problems sometimes and many times do come from applications. While they may come from applications, it's oftentimes in history, the big problems that came were not necessarily solved by the industry because industry does have a bottom line. They have shareholders, they have quarterly earning statements, they have all sorts of things that, you know, the Dow Industrial Average, et cetera. So they basically will, again, these problems will then become long-term horizon problems that academia are deep industrial research labs have worked on. To me, Bell Labs, and nowadays Microsoft Research to some extent, has been the only thing which really did long-term research oh, with not much. Sides? No, 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 <laughs> I, I'm just saying that, I'm just saying that Eric is sitting that Thank side you. of sitting you this take side. Note when you should have been on this side. <laughs> so I, I think that basically most industries just cannot afford to solve the deep problems that their applications bring up. And so somebody, sometimes you will have to actually take a longer term view again. So oh. well, let, let me address what Carla said, and this is kind of related to what Raul said as well. So, so I think it's a little, there's a little bit of a confusion in Carla's argument here, which is that it's, yeah, in the industry, it's just a, we had industry attacks of problems that have financial value, and there's lots of important problems that AI can solve that has no value. No. It, 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 so so <laughs> if, if this is, if, if we are to pick important problems and solve them, that becomes the industry, and therefore those problems are industry relevant from day one, which is why we are right. Oh, so so well, let, me, let well, me just well, make a comment. Well, it's the tragedy of the yeah. comments. So make a, com a comment. I mean, it's maybe we, everyone's thinking in terms of 1970s Wall Street bottom line, 
But I'm going to put out there uh, some words from Peter Drucker, if you know who he was, a 1940s uh, business scholar. Uh, and I think this is, resonates at Microsoft today, today's Microsoft and other companies. Profit is not the primary goal, only an essential condition for sustainability. A company's primary responsibility is to serve its customers and do that well. If you do that well, that's where the wealth comes from. Doing that well in artificial intelligence means really sucking in, understanding, and addressing a portfolio of issues across time horizons. And I would say the portfolio at, at, at several R&D labs represents the portfolio we see at AAAI in this conference. So, so if any, that's very much a beautiful uh, ideal to live by, but any of the people in the audience really believe that the current day companies mostly do that? I have a couple of bridges, one in Manhattan, one in Brooklyn that I can sell you very soon. I just do not think that the companies can afford to take that beautiful view that Peter Drucker expressed. It's a great uh, uh, like a ideal that they would like to keep in mind, but that's just not what happens. And eventually, longer term research will come back. To let, let, me, let, me share, let me just share a, a, another Peter Drucker comment. I have to feel better about myself sitting here. He <laughs> said, great companies could stand among humankind's noblest inventions. <laughs> now think about this. They lean into the real world. They're taking signals. They're trying to, their wealth comes from customer value innovating with principles and applications and understanding them deeply over time. And in, in, a, in a world where you're competing with other companies, staying ahead on principles and deep integration of your R&D facilities and, and investments with your bottom line is gonna be very important. And I, I wanna kind of emphasize that also. Like if you think about, as I do, that the number one problem in the world is climate change. If we actually come up with good solutions to that, they will become industry. It's not like we're gonna make a climate change solution from here and open source it and then it's gonna change the world. If it creates value, it's gonna become industry. And we're seeing things like, of course, Tesla, which we could argue whether it's AI or not, but you know, that's uh, one example where value gets created by better technology that solves a big problem. Uh, so I think that when we do good, eventually if there's a lot of good there, there's value, there's gonna be industry. So well, I'd like to just pull the room for a second, because uh, there's sort of a factual claim being made here that I, I think it'd be interesting to know what everyone here thinks. So what Profit. fraction of you feel that the, the balance of topics studied at AAAI varying between those things that are of immediate interest to industry and those things that are kind of longer term is, as I think uh, both of these guys just claimed, about right? What fraction of you feels like we're, we're, we're doing about the right job in sort of grand social challenges and, and problems that industry cares about? Uh, you're supposed to raise your hand if you agree with this. <laughs> and and uh, what, what about those who, who feel like the balance is uh, not about right? And which way? So, uh, so, 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 so people yeah, are in the middle, so Thomas I think. wants us to refine that. So, so what fraction of you thinks that the balance is not right because we should be focused more on the short-term interests of industry? <laughs> the recruiters will come find you after the talk. Our, mo our moderator is leading the witness. I'm surprised. So, that so my question then, you know, with some audience participation, yeah. is how, how do you guys account for the mismatch between what exactly. you've been arguing and, and what the room seems to think? I think most people didn't vote on either case, to be honest. <laughs> I'm not sure if you have a good so signal. So you think here. the silent oh, oh. majority is in favor of your position? Yeah. Yeah. It's because you said short-term sure. interest and in industry in the same there. sentence. That, that, that same silent majority that supported Nixon for quite a long time is supporting this position, I think. <laughs> really? That, that's all you guys have on that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, the way you put it was, again, which, which wasn't resonant with what I said, which, which people, but what topics here in the portfolio is in support of the, the short-term interest, the interests of companies, and I made the comment that the short-term research is part of the long-term, is, is actually a long-term strategy for companies. Uh, and so I, we, we need the whole portfolio at the companies themselves. I think if I'm a company, if I'm starting a company, immediate interest problems will be of necessity short-term because I have to actually survive. You know, Microsoft is a, what knows, $3 trillion company or something right now. <laughs> and so they can have you do some long-term research, but a startup, probably does not have oh, Thomas. that. Thomas has a CMU job. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you might Wait a minute, that was, that was a secret, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you might have forgotten that. And he keeps writing papers. Um, <laughs> so, so I think it's just, 
it, it's a question of, I mean, the, the, the way it is posed is a very carefully posed um, uh, proposition because, in fact, it does talk about the zeitgeist right now. As Yoshua was talking about yesterday, we all have the situation where students are just trying to get into, let's just use some data, do some, um, you know, uh, algorithms on that and see if we can get some immediate gratification. I'm all for immediate gratification, but if everybody in the society, academia, industry, everybody is into immediate gratification, we won't be here. And that's, I'm sure you completely believe that because in essence, we have had in AI is a classic case of people who have worked on long-term problems up until very recently when everything that we do is in tech press, page one or page two right now. And that kind of increases this interest of, I have four weeks, can I write a paper? Uh, and you cannot do long-term research in I have four weeks, can I write a paper? My, my point, Val, earlier was that in talking about uh, academic research not focusing on immediate problems of industry, we're overlooking the fact that there's an immediacy to long-term research. It's a semantic twist. But this is what, hap this is what happens in, in, in industry right now. It's not just the urgent needs of today's product line. It's thinking through product planning and thinking out of the box on new whole divisions that might pop up, uh, thinking through how do we attract top talent to work on a portfolio of, of time frames, uh, and therefore having people that are theorists that just think out of the box and work on theory on topics that's not relevant to Microsoft anytime soon as part of our, our building a rich, thriving research entity, an R&D center at an industry lab. No, I, I want to actually add, address that startup point you raised there, uh, which is that, yes, startups do have an immediate need to deliver something and be, uh, all that. And uh, by those examples that I gave you in the very beginning, those three examples came from that. There was an immediate need to deliver something, and then there was a hole. There was a huge hole in the armor and not, uh, you needed to fix that. And that led to the whole new research fields within AI. I, I'm, I'm sorry, which examples did I give? Well, uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, the point is compact I, natural bidding I'm languages, automated mechanism design, preference elicitation, and multi-agent systems were the three that I them. gave. You may have thought about it yourself in your head, talking to yourself, but I didn't mention any of them. No, no, um, no, I mentioned them, so, but, but they, oh. they're a counterexample to, the, uh, to, to what you were saying. Uh, but again, but again, this idea that um, uh, an immediate problem has an immediate solution is also a fallacy. There I, are immediate problems arising now that are whole research areas that came from industry that are opening up and they're for all to be working on, including people outside of industry. But, but again and again in history, when the immediate problem has an extremely hard solution, industry had to move on and academia had to continue working. Is that's, it the that's case? The point. Is it the case that, that, that perception the, wasn't that's a the, problem back that, in Thank you, Ralph. I think you just made our point. You made our point. No. We're, we're saying that industry not. problems, <laughs> industry problems <laughs> pose not. whole <laughs> directions for academic research to help the problems and beyond. No, folks in academia, folks working with longer term wound up working on these problems when industry moved on and they said, we'll just do whatever little thing we can do with, you know, per, uh, on perception as again, it's trying to solve the, the problem. There, there okay, it's time to wrap up this phase. I'm going to give the last word to Carla, who's been trying to get a word in. Well, I'm, I'm and again, Carla, let me remind you, the microphone I, is I'm, in front of you. I, I'm pivoting now, not really, but... Uh, but <laughs> But, you know, I, I do think that uh, academia is really facing uh, 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 a major problem in terms of the publication that was raised by my colleagues. And indeed, you know, I talk about this total, totally unconstrained and we can really uh, think uh, big and long term. But it's not actually happening. A, a lot of our students, indeed, are now just thinking, you know, a month, a two-month uh, uh, window. And, and that is really quite, uh, quite concerning. I, I find it quite concerning. And to some extent, I'm going to say that, to some extent, industry, perhaps because they have uh, different metrics, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the publication is not the key metric. They actually m may have some goals. For example, let's beat uh, the, the uh, 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 human, the champion goal. Or let's have other goals and, and uh, that allows, you know, 
to work towards goals. We are, I, I'm concerned that the long-term vision for, for, for our research that academia in principle would allow us to do, that is under threat, perhaps also has to do with the, the you know the pressure that uh, that uh, especially the the young generation they feel they have to publish 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 so i think we need to actually think about different models for publishing maybe different uh, models to evaluate impact i actually had uh, 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 i was on a panel with uh, Joshua and i was very happy when he said that well, maybe we should have a different metric, and metric is really how we are uh, heavy impact as opposed to the number of publications. So that's, uh, uh, you know, perhaps uh, uh, the way I can find some common ground with, with the rest of the panel. But, but indeed, you know, I think it's important for us to think about impact as opposed to little uh, Epsilon, little epsilon publication that uh, that uh, is not uh, mm -hmm. uh, very yeah. very deep. <laughs> now that we are thinking in in terms of uh, you know uh, deep approaches, so that's. I think we with that. Thank you. Okay, so the closing statements from the others. I'll, I'll let you guys go in whatever order oh, you prefer. This, oh, this uh, was a closing well, statement. It, it <laughs> sounded like it was your closing statement. Let's. Uh, so. If you have anything more you'd like to say as part of your closing statement, no, no, why no, don't you do it now? I'm fine. I, I still believe that you know, uh, in academia, we should really pursue you know big visions, try to tackle big challenge. Yes, I you know I don't really believe that uh, you know industry is going to really be pushing the uh, addressing the climate change, uh, the sustainability issues. I think we should, and uh, and uh, uh, we should address uh, you know these uh, uh, challenges. And again, I believe that actually will lead to fundamental advances in AI. Thanks, Carla. Thanks, Carla. I can just clo close here. So, so let me just uh, come down off my assigned position here and just say that I think we do face opportunities and challenges and some crises when it comes to academia versus uh, industry research and R&D, uh, in particular compensation models, other kinds of, of, of differences of, of career choice metrics, benchmarks. Uh, and I've, I've sat on NSF committees and, um, and DARPA committees and we talk about, you know, what, what should what should the funding agencies be funding, given that the industry is, fund is, is gonna be moving ahead anyway in areas A, B, and C? And so these are interesting questions that come up. I guess, I'm, as you may have heard from my earlier comments, I see the, the rise of deeply shared scientific questions and challenges across the whole community, no matter where people call home. And the questions that arise in, on both sides are interesting and relevant to, to the whole community. Um, uh, they we, we, but we definitely see questions from industry framing uh, research uh, that goes long and deep, even if it was coming out of an immediate concern in industry. Um, um, so given these shared questions and research pursuits, but different funding models um, and the intrinsic and I think the you know, sort of uh, uh, increasing differences in things like data and compute resources, there's really a great opportunity ahead for all of us and in leaders in agencies as well as in, in, in industry and other civil society to think through um, and to find mechanisms and best practices uh, that can enable these communities to work together effectively. And this includes the sharing of problems, data, compute, expertise, even sharing of teaching and mentoring uh, across the two communities. I think it's gonna be very important, especially with the quote unquote brain drain into R&D in industry. I just see great things ahead overall as a unified community uh, with a shared interest in key problems and challenges. Thanks, Eric. Um, uh, Thomas, are you willing to? Uh, sure, give your, I'll your last uh, give my feeble opponent the last word here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So, um, yeah, um, I'll also soften my position a little bit towards what I really believe. I, by the way, I believe most of what I said. But <laughs> 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 so, um, uh, yeah, I think it's really important to work on real problems. And uh, I, I really believe that this, I, I agree with Carla, this idea of you're going to look at the proceedings and see where you can make a tiny improvement in a few weeks. That is really not good. We, we need to have this. Uh, real world issues that drive our research agendas and uh, it doesn't always have to be through industry 
like in our kidney exchange, there's probably no commercial opportunity, and we've still been doing that uh, uh, and um, making a dent. Uh, but oftentimes, it is A, coming from industry, or will be going into industry. So if, you, if you're doing academic work, it becomes relevant, and it's not an industrial interest in some industry now, it will become an industry if you're successful. Thank you. Thanks for being succinct, Thomas, because I want to make sure we still do have time for questions. But before that, we're going to hear from, uh, from Rafa. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, so first of all, um, we are all closer than we obviously made it sound for your entertainment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we are not saying that industrial research has no meaning. It should be there. It should actually be working on problems that are of direct um, you know, uh, dispatchability like tomorrow. Um, the question really that's posed to the uh, forum here is whether the both academia and industry should all be focusing on problems of immediate interest to the industry. It is important, I believe, for academics to be collaborating with industry and involved in the, uh, you know, industry's interest in doing AI research, just especially because of the significant amount of misperceptions about AI that are all over the place in once you start coming down from Microsofts and you know the one of the top few places, people just have no clue actually what is feasible, what is not feasible. And so in fact it would be great for academic people to be involved with the, you know in, in these collaborations. I personally have gotten money from Google, IBM, JP Morgan, nothing somehow from Microsoft, and I think he will send it right after this. But never again. But, but, for, but for long term research and also for collaboration, you know, a long term research problems that are inspired by their current immediate needs rather than something that I just delivered to them. The delivery part is what employees are for and they get paid in real money, not in the faculty money that I wind up getting. Um, so in, in conclusion, I think that it is important to have this distinction between longer term research and the academia should be focusing a lot more on the academic you know, long term research. Why would you want to sit in academia, take cheap salaries, and work on his problems for which he gets a lot more money? Just don't do that. And also, I have set up a GoFundRavs group page. <laughs> Please go and fund it, because after this, Eric is not going to send me any money. And that's all the time we have for you, Rav. <laughs> So, so let's give another hand to our, our uh, four very good sports up here who are willing to, uh, to, to be our panelists. So thanks once again, guys. <laughs> and now is time for our audience vote. So, so the official vote will be on Twitter, so we can, uh, we can actually count. Uh, incidentally, the, uh, the first vote on Twitter had 167 of you vote, and it was 77% in favor of the proposition. So I have the, the poll open on the, uh, on the second vote, but let's do it by show of hands uh, now for the immediacy of it. So how many people after the debate uh, feel like they're in favor of the proposition? How many people after the debate feel like they're against the proposition? Okay, now here's the important part. How many of you uh, changed your opinion to be in favor of the proposition after the debate? How many of you changed your opinion to be against the proposition after the debate? Mm. Welcome to America. <laughs> <laughs> and so with that, uh, let's uh, have a chance to get some uh, questions and reaction from the audience. I invite you to come up to the microphones if you have either a question for the panel, a statement, or an outrageous thing that you'd like to say. Go ahead, I think you were first. Hi, Woo. Chris Welty, Google Research. This panel reminded me of what AI used to be like before industry came to the rescue. A bunch of people just arguing with absolutely no basis to resolve the argument other than who's funniest or who sticks to their guns with the most <laughs> energy. Uh, and so if the- Do you have a question? Yeah. If, uh, did you want to be on the panel? <laughs> if, I, I invited reaction. Did you wanted to come here. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. But, okay. I have a question. If can I get on stage then? If our uh, 
academic colleagues would like to dismiss economic value as a way of judging what's a reasonable thing to work on, I would love to hear you give a proposal for some other way of measuring value. Come on, so I take on to you guys. Mark, go ahead, yeah. Well, I'm going to just, I'm, I'm, I just think you guys have citations and age scores. You can say all these I'm, wonderful I'm not things. Even sure. <laughs> I'm not even sure. I think all research has an economic proposition. It's a question of delayed reward. This is something that AI people talk about. You know, I don't know if it's reached industry or not yet. But, <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Since you get to be funny, I get to be funny. <laughs> um, nothing well, personal. Fine. Uh, but I think I, we are all interested in economic propositions. It's a question of how soon and what is the discount factor. Okay, let, let's try to keep this moving because we have questions from a lot of people. So let's go over to this microphone over here. So at the, at the end of the day, um, you work on the things that you get paid for, uh, whether you are in academia or in industry. And given that uh, the amount of funding from industry to academia is minuscule, compared to the funding we get. I mean, you get $50,000 from Google for some <laughs> big competition that 1,000 people compete for, uh, as opposed to NSF, you get a million dollar grant. I mean, it's clearly there is a minuscule incentive that industry gives. Uh, it's, isn't it natural that uh, academia works on the problem that it gets paid for, for with you write proposals and federal government and systems decide? Is there anything that industry can do the question is, are, are NSF proposals, call, call for proposals, partly shaped by industry results? I think it should be shaped, shaped by uh, what helps the humanity, what helps the, you know, the nation, what helps uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And not by, uh, you know, what will help uh, industry, because industry... Excuse me, but humanity is at the other end of the industry, isn't it? Um, yeah, but, uh, you know, you think about uh, Microsoft, the amount of fund that Microsoft spends on research which may be doing longer term research is minuscule part of the funds that it spends for those uh, things of immediate interest That's not and true. revenue. That's not true. Uh, I don't know, okay, that, that was my look at, our, look at our annual report. Okay. All right, and uh, with the definitive answer to that question, let's move to this microphone over here. <laughs> so, so Rao, that was, that was brilliant theater, and I applaud you for it, but you missed a real opportunity for hyperbole from Henry's talk. Uh, and that is, it's clear that industry wants AI for strip mining the Marianas Trench and for strip mining <laughs> the minds of your children. Uh, and, uh, and what do you want AI for? What do I want AI to do? I'm sorry, I, I didn't get, did, do you have a question? I think that's what he asked you, yeah. Yeah, so first of all, I, I don't know, strip mining Mariana Trench sounds kind of interesting but hard. But <laughs> <laughs> But, I mean, certainly, yeah. we have been spending time, like yesterday, for example, in the evening sessions and so on, about the many open problems that we still have in front of us. That's what makes AI a beautiful area to be working in. Go to a database conference, it's boring, because it's been done, okay? And that's what makes us interesting. So I have no dearth of problems. I can write, talk about my own interesting problems, for example, human AI collaboration, which it turns out lots of people on this table are also interested in. And, and there are great work that needs to be done in many of these directions. I think there's no dearth of problems in AI. We have both immediate potential for doing the things. It's a question of exploration, exploitation, trade-off. One more of these academic AI things, you know, People can complete the elementary school education and say, hey, now time to make some money, let's go flip burgers, versus they can continue doing some more work. And so right now we have some pieces that we can directly you know, exploit, but there are also so many things that we have to actually explore. And that's what mm -hmm. AI is, that's why I, AI is intellectually such a beautiful discipline yeah. to me. I want to just make a comment, and maybe people in the audience can look this up but I believe that R&D in industry is a significant part of R&D in the world, and you can compare it to government funding of core basic research, and you'll see it's a significant chunk coming from industry. Okay, let's go back to the middle microphone here. Um, so I wonder if the question is ill-posed. Um, yes. <laughs> you would think that. <laughs> okay, we'll do another panel then. <laughs> We'll so, start from scratch. So, so, so I, I, I like the comparisons with, uh, I mean, thinking about the reward structure, the objective function. 
different organizations have a different kind of reward function. So in the debate, you talked about uh, uh, the difference between large companies and small companies. And there's, there's a good reason why they really need to look at a different horizon. Exactly. And also, so there's, there's the horizon and also the um, uh, alignment of the objective with respect to public good. If you're a small company, then you really have to go for your survival. Um, whereas if you're, you know, uh, half of the you know, IT in the world, then it, it's like you're the world. And so you really have to take care that the world continues to exist tomorrow. And, and that's better aligned with the public good. Um, academia is at the extreme of this. It, you know, uh, we have the possibility of uh, working for the public good and we have the possibility of working on these long-term projects. But, but some people in industry also can have that. So I think the, the, the question of industry versus not industry is not the right question. So let me, let me actually t take issue with one of the things you said there, which is that big, big companies are somehow better aligned with public good than small companies. I actually think it's the opposite. Uh, I think that small companies, while well, they have a very short-term uh, horizon by necessity, uh, a lot of novel things come out of those more. I agree, novel I agree. things come out of that I agree, I agree. And, and things that create social value. Well, so, so one thing is the objective and then how well you execute it, right? Yep. Go for it. Uh, so first of all, I already the, it admitted that Don Bengio is on our side, essentially. He's an honorary <laughs> member. Uh, uh, but I completely agree with you that we have obviously for the debate purposes made it a polarized thing, but it really is about horizon. It's about the question of there are things in AI right now that basically does, don't really require that much intellectual power, but can make you tons and tons of money and many grad students want to know what those are. And I just wish that they actually work on the thing for which they have the brains that were there and you know, which is a longer term problem. And so it's a really a question of, it's, it's not a single um, an extreme, it's just a question of you know, where, in your, where is the horizon? And, 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 and as long as different uh, preferences exist, we will have these different horizons and different companies. It's not a question of large versus small companies. Some, people, some companies have longer horizons, some will have shorter horizons. And I think it is the way it is supposed to be. Academia in particular is not a company, even though many people seem to think so. And academic people should be thinking more by default long term. That's what I think. So, so I propose at this point to go once more to each of those two microphones, unless the program chairs uh, tell me that we, we need to cut this off. We good? All right, so let's, uh, let's go over here. So, so this is more of a quick comment, but uh, we're here in this grand tradition of, of an academic debate, right? And I would say there's an even grander tradition of academic freedom. And so any proposition that says what academia should and should not be working on should be defeated. Can we go back to the golden age where you had things like the transistor coming from Bell Labs and the wow. relational model coming back, coming from IBM, but Larry Ellison making money out of it. IBM didn't care about it. Everyone knows the story and, uh, and so on. There are many, many brilliant people at MSR, IBM, and other labs these days. But uh, I'm kind of asking that uh, to Eric because he has a lot of experience it's a serious question, it's not a joke. Can we kind of dream of that, this, of no, those no. old times where you had this kind of things in research labs? Can I think absolutely. In fact, uh, we, we have meetings where we say, okay, Microsoft Research has been here since 1991. Where is our transistor? We actually ask these questions, like what, what's been the, what have been the major accomplishments? Have we created the, we do think of, and we reflect Aren't you afraid of the relational model? <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, so, I mean, there's more going on in quantum that could, could deliver that transistor. There are other kinds of foundational uh, innovations. But we see, again, I see this as hand in hand with our academic research colleagues. Um, I, I see it as a community that we're in. Um, you know, I would say when Jeff Hinton came to MSR for the summer and did the first, uh, w with our speech team, the first serious uh, deep learning for a speech model on switchboard data. That was kind of a transistor, and, and it was a collaboration yeah. between academia and Microsoft Research. So, how, how do you avoid losing the relational model, for instance? Like yeah. uh, IBM kind of not used the relational model. Larry Ellison made money out of it. 
it was invented at IBM by Ted Codd, but IBM didn't make money out of it. So. <laughs> well, look, we have, uh, uh, if, if Johan de Clear is in the audience, we had a nice talk last night, once again, about Xerox Park. Yeah. So yeah. we can just stop there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been trying to get yeah. in here. So. Yeah. Maybe, Maybe Carla as well. I, I just would like to make a comment about Bell Labs because indeed I think that's a model that is unique. And uh, in fact, I recommend there's a book called The Idea Factory that really shows, you know, how uh, 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 research, uh, research labs, when they were focused on uh, 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 a mission, you know, advancing uh, communications, all kinds of uh, communications, the tremendous progress that really uh, 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 resulted from uh, the focus on, on uh, uh, advancing communications. That's exactly, you know, I wish we could go back to this model, even academia, because we, we, we are now in this super fast uh, publication cycle, we are losing that. Yeah, but agree. on the other I hand, agree. Bell Labs was an amazing model pursuing a, a, a vision, a mission, and it also shows that, you know, you can collaborate and you can, you know, uh, 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 advance research long term if you have a mission, if you have a goal. So I, 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 I don't think we have that uh, anymore, but, but it would be great to, to have again uh, uh, Bell Labs. So on this one rare occasion, I would disagree with my own um, uh, uh, teammate, I think sometimes the old days are not that great. Bell Labs, all of us scientists have real, real soft corner for Bell Labs. But just remember that Bell Labs was part of a monopoly. And monopoly because of which we, I, I used to, when I first came to US, it would take me a whole day to make a call to India. Right now, as I am talking to you guys, my family is sending me messages. That is what, not having a monopoly meant. There is Bell Labs, there are Bell Labs now, they're just called universities. That's the way it's supposed to be. Well, I'm really sorry that we have to leave it there, but I'm conscious that the poster session is beginning just as we speak, and I don't want to deny the <laughs> many poster presenters, all of you as an audience. So uh, I, it's clear there's a lot of passion in the room. I, we hope this has started a conversation. We hope the, the lighthearted tone that we've taken here hasn't uh, fooled you into thinking that this is a lighthearted question. I think there's a lot more to be said, and we hope those conversations continue uh, over the evening and in the days ahead. Uh, Thank you all for your attention. Thanks again. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for organizing. Thanks, Kevin.